Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our first estate planning webinar of 2023. Um, it's so nice to see you all here. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kara McDonald. I'm the Director of Philanthropy and Plan Giving at the Seattle Public Library Foundation. And with me today is Desiree Good, the Vice President of the King County Library System Foundation Board. I want to start off by saying thank you to so many of you for tuning in today. Um, we had almost 1,000 people register for this webinar, which is incredible, uh, a little intimidating, um, but just amazing that you're all here to see us. So thank you for being here. Um, our two library foundations have been partnering to host these free estate planning webinars since May of 2020, and this is by far the most we've ever had. So again, we're excited to see you all. And um, since there are some new faces out there, just want to say thank you again for using and supporting our libraries. Um, we're grateful to see you all here today. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that the land that both of our libraries are on is the ancestral homelands of all tribes and bands of the Coast Salish peoples, including unceded territories. We honor with gratitude the land itself and thank the original caretakers who are still here and have lived here since time immemorial. We hope that you will take this in and use library resources to study and understand this history and then go forward in whatever way inspires you. Next, I'm gonna tell you a little about our foundations. As a board member for KCLS Foundation, I am repeatedly reminded of just how important legacy gifts are to our long-term sustainability. Anyone who includes an estate gift to our libraries is invited to join SBLF's Library Legacy Society and or KCLF's Literary Legends Society. And if you wanna talk more about your estate plans, endowments, or other ideas, Jessica Carso from the KCLS Foundation and Kara McDonald are here for you. And their contact info will be on the screen at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Desiree. Um, so today's topic is a little different from our regular estate planning webinar themes. Uh, today we're focusing on something that is clearly at the top of mind for a lot of you, and that is how to organize and declutter your digital legacy. And we are so happy to have Bridget Agabra here with us again today. Um, Bridget, do you want to join us on screen and say hi? Um, thank you. Hello. So <laughs> So Bridget provides patient, compassionate technology training and services for seniors and the tech uncomfortable through her local company, gentletechhelp.com. She loves reducing the frustration people feel with their digital devices through talks, classes, and individual assistance. She holds certificates in gerontology and tech writing and has extensive entrepreneurial experience. With an eye on the future of technology, Bridget is passionate about the magic that immersive technology will be bringing to our lives. Um, Bridget's going to present for the next 30 to 40 minutes, and then she will field as many questions as she can in uh, a live Q&A at the end. Um, but just remember, there are way more of you than there are of her. So if you see a question you like in the box, uh, be sure to upvote it, and you don't have to retype the whole question. Um, and Bridget, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you. Hi, um, and I do want to mention that uh, every Wednesday from two to three, the King County Library um, presents technology programs for older adults uh, from two to three. Go to the kclf.org website, and I present those too every Wednesday, two to three, and that's pretty fun. Um, tomorrow is going to be about exploring YouTube. So thank you all for being here today. This is such an important topic. And I want to both thank you and apologize because an hour from now, you're going to have like more stuff on your important to do list. And I'm so sorry, but it's really important. And it's good that we get things handled. So I would like to tell you how I'm going to present. I have these slides and what I'm going to be doing is kind of popping in and out like this. So I'm going to make the slides big and then I'm going to pop in and talk about them. Um, you'll be getting notes that include all the writing on those slides. So not what I'm speaking, but everything that's writing. So you can kind of sit back and pay attention um, or use the Q&A. They'll be sending you the notes um, from, the, um, from the program where you signed up. Uh, so popping in and out. First thing I do want to say is there was a slide a little earlier that said this is not a replacement for professional legal financial help. So please 
make your decisions, you know, based on what's right for you. Uh, this is also for people, not for businesses. So this is individuals. And I'm especially aiming towards people who are some tech uncomfortable, who aren't really enjoying jumping into this process, right? So what we're trying to do here is set up some tools for the people who might need to step in to your lives. If something happens to you, you know, we, we tend to have thoughts in our head about, who we could call on to water the grass. Well, maybe not here in PNW in the winter, but who's going to get your mail? Who's going to feed the cat if something happens to you if you're laid up for a while? Um, so these are the kind of things we don't tend to think about those for our digital assets and our digital things. So we're going to be jumping in, thinking about decluttering and making things better for those who have to help us when things are put together. So the first step is... Um, talking about why we would do this. And one of the basic reasons is decluttering is more efficient for you. The number of people that have problems with their passwords, I mean, I can't see any of you, but I'm assuming that there's a lot of eyes rolling. The amount of time that is spent dealing with password issues is just such a waste of time. Or people looking for their photos. Where are my photos that I took 10 years ago? Where are those things? So it makes your life more efficient. Um, I have this graphic here of a whole bunch of board game bits and pieces dumped on the ground. You'll see game of life and dice and poker chips and dominoes. Bringing all of your digital pieces together is a real kindness for your family too, or for whoever's stepping in. And I do wanna say, I tend to use the word family, but within that word family, I know there are so many um, situations where Family is not who will be handling these things. But I'm going to use family as a shorthand. The technical word would be your designated agents. But that just doesn't fall as um, lightly from my tongue. So um, it's efficient for you. It's a kindness for your family. If you pass away or if you had a stroke or if you had some other issue, there's a lot going on. And People, you know, as much as you can help them from having to dig out your password from somewhere or trying to not be able to pay your bills, you know, it's a it's a true kindness. I deal with widows all the time, and it is not always the most fun for them to be sitting in front of the computer trying to hack into the family finances. So, and it also keeps your story together. You don't want to lose your writings or your photos and things. It keeps the story together. And if you don't take care of it, a lot of times your people won't even know that it's there, right? So digital decluttering. Well, decluttering is like decluttering, all right? Like think of your digital stuff. If it's just like a giant pile of socks on the floor, every time you want to get a pair of socks, you're spending time looking for two that match and that they're clean or whatever, right? So the key is not to be overwhelmed at whatever the situation of your digital things are. You want to work on getting them as tidy and put together as works for you. So for some people, that might mean, you know, just getting them into a, a drawer that's labeled socks, you know, on the right. Or it might mean somebody being very, you know, um, completionist and, you know, putting the socks by individual, by groups and by types and things. None of these are my sock drawers, not one of these. But if you get a little bit done, you are further along than you were and you have done some help. So any bit that you can do, pat yourself on the back and don't worry about it if your stuff doesn't look like the sock drawer on the left. We all can't be Marie Kondo. Even Marie Kondo apparently can't be Marie Kondo anymore. So let's talk about the ways that we would do this digital decluttering, this plan for our things. Three phases, easy peasy, but it'd take a lot of work and a lot of time. One, gathering and sorting your digital assets. And I'm gonna go into excruciating detail about all of these things and it will be in the notes. So gathering and sorting your digital assets, you can almost think of that like taking your regular possessions and putting them into bins. You know, this bin is labeled craft supplies and this bin is labeled, you know, old family albums from grandma and things. So you're gonna be gathering things together and putting them in organized areas. 
you're going to secure your data. And I say we already have a question about securing. So securing your data, it might be cloud storage, it might be local options. We'll talk about some different things. And then notifying their agents, notifying your family. If you do all this work and nobody knows how to get in or how to get to it, you know, that's no fun. So again, I know that I'm speaking very quickly. There's a lot to get through because we want to leave some time for questions and you'll be having all of this stuff in the notes. All right, ready to go? We're going to start with gather. This is the one that takes the longest time. What we're going to do is going to begin our gathering. You have a much bigger digital footprint than you think. People say, oh, I don't use the computer for anything. And you go, okay. Well, you have an Amazon account. Everybody has to deal with the hassles of my chart or my medical portal. And then there's the, you know, digital pharmacy. And then there's, oh, yeah, there was the old photo, you know, gallery that I used to have. Like over time, if you take a few weeks, you're going to see you have a much bigger digital footprint than you think you do. So spend some time and really bring together everything that you can, thinking about things you use currently, things you haven't used in a while. And know that nobody knows your digital life better than you. And a little tiny um, discreet aside, sometimes there are things that people have in their digital lives that they don't actually want other people to see. I call those items that kind of you'd prefer them to die with you. And if you have things like that, take care of that because um, there are situations in which families really have very bad experiences, um, finding things that maybe shouldn't have been found in the first place. So there are ways to deal with that. So think about that and take care of those. Right. So these are our three phases. These are three, um, excuse me. The first of our three phases is gather. And if you do nothing else but this next slide, nothing else but this next slide, which is gonna have several parts, you will be doing a great kindness to everybody involved in your digital legacy. So this is the most important slide. It has a big red circle with a star on it. So there's no question. Biggest thing, biggest thing, all your email accounts have all of your email accounts and all of their passwords and all of the security questions. It's so easy to forget writing down the answer to the security questions. And I'll be sitting with widows and they'll be saying, okay, who was his best best friend in high school? Was it, was it William? No, was it Eddie? No, uh, Edward? Yeah, I mean, seriously, or you're thinking of trying to think of the name of the pet. Right, write down those questions. They're moving away from those now, but lots of accounts still have those. So why email accounts? Because when you forget the password from a, some other account, usually there's something that says, click here and we'll send you, email you a reset. We'll mail you a password reset. So if your family can get to that, if you can get to that, if you, you know, there's a time when you wake up and you've had a stroke and um, you, know, you don't remember things, get this information, the, all your email accounts. And if you can notify which is the important one, which is the one that your password, you know, if you click forgot password, what's the one that that goes to? Sometimes people have had sort of a junk email back in the day when there weren't a lot of good email filters. Sometimes people, I have a junk throwaway email and I have a real email. And, you know, sometimes they both wind up getting full of junk. But I had one person who used her junk email to sign up for her Apple ID because she thought her Apple ID was just a junk throwaway thing when it's really the key of your relationship with Apple. So um, make sure all of your emails are gathered and all of the passwords. And if you can note, if you have a lot of emails, note which is the one that the passwords that you would um, have you used most often on accounts. Second part of this very important page, remember, if you do nothing else, um, still stay for the rest of the talk, but if you do nothing else after this slide, um, you've done a big deal. So all your email accounts. Number two, your Apple, Google, and Microsoft accounts. Most people have an account with at least two of these organizations. They 
Google might be Gmail, it might be Chrome, it might be your Chromebook. Microsoft might be your Hotmail account, your Office 365 account, your laptop that has a Microsoft, uh, your Microsoft laptop, and Apple. Apple is tied, everything Apple is tied together, your Mac and your uh, iOS devices. So have your accounts, have the emails that you use to sign into those accounts, have the PIN, the PIN that you use to open the device. So you know how you have to, maybe you use your face or your thumbprint, but there's also the little uh, four digit code, or maybe it's a gesture, it's a shape. Have that available with your passwords. It's as important as the password of the account. Sometimes people keep their passwords and things in their device and then nobody can get in, right? Nobody can get in. So make sure that you have the little pin you use to log into your computer, your laptop, your phone, your devices, so that somebody can use them. Yeah. That's an easy one to forget. Lastly, I'd like to encourage you, if you use some kind of cloud storage system for anything, for photos or for anything, Make sure that that's noted and how you pay for it, because maybe somebody doesn't know that you, uh, maybe it's not really apparent that you save all your, uh, uh, you know, personal poetry on Dropbox, which is a cloud storage system, you know, and maybe they don't really know that and it's paid for using a credit card that winds up getting canceled or tied to a checking account that gets canceled. You want your really important stuff to be able to be accessed. Now this would be really easy, except that two-factor authentication is something that complicates this. It really complicates it. What is two-factor authentication? Should you use it? Number one, two-factor authentication is wonderful and you should use it for anything that has to do with money. Two-factor authentication is, you know, when you log into your bank account and they go, oh, we have to text you on your phone. Well, what they're doing is they're taking that extra step that um, it uses at least two different methods to verify who you are. And remember, the companies have to verify who you are. They have a legal responsibility as well as just them not wanting the hassle of dealing with uh, uh, people, bad guys. Um, they want to really know that they're dealing with you. So two-factor authentication goes beyond just using a password, which is something you know. It might be texting a code to your phone, which is something you have, or it might be based on using your thumbprint or your facial ID, which is something that you are. So they're, they want to go one step beyond just knowing the password and username. Now, in the next couple of years, they're just just starting to be using some new systems that are a little different than, than the code. They're going to be holding up your phone and the phone's going to be verifying through QR code. So that's just starting out. So we're not there yet, but we're still at the password thing. So sometimes your family member can't just log in with the password and with um, the username. They're going to need to verify in a different way. Maybe they'll have your phone with them. Maybe they won't have your phone. So the way around this is to really utilize as many um, 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 recovery ways as possible. So what that means is when you sign up for an account and they go, if we need to get hold of you, what's a phone number? What's use an email? Use a phone number, use another email if they give you the chance. So have it be a couple of ways. So if the only way that they can verify you is through your phone and, you know, heaven forbid you've been in a car accident, your phone's not there, or maybe, you know, you've got a family member across the country and they don't have the phone with them, but they can access your email. Remember from the beginning of the slide, they can say, okay, send me a verification in the email. And they can access your email and get in. So this two-factor authentication, it's something new. It's something really, really good. And everyone should have it on there. Anything to do with finances, because you don't want it that 
if somebody has your password and ID that they can log in and just run and get your cash, right? And then they're gone before you even know about it. You want the bank to have other um, ways to verify you and most banks require it these days. So that's two-factor authentication that complicates it, but it just means that you need to um, get have all of the information you can available for your people. So that's that one big slide. Now we're gonna coast for everything else that, that the rest of the presentation. So what else are we gathering? Well, let's dig right in. I'm gonna go over these fairly quickly so we can have some time. You're gonna be gathering passwords, usernames, and those security questions. And these are the things on this first page that you might think of, of course, off the top of your head, your car registration, your car loan, your banking, your brokerage accounts, bonds. If you've signed up for those I-bonds, those great high interest I-bonds now, you don't have a paper bond and they don't send you email, the treasury department, like no one in your family would ever know you had them unless you really noted them somewhere. So there's a lot of things like that where there's kind of no trace of it if you don't note it, right? Um, would like to really emphasize it's not, have your, not just your social security number, but that social security account login information. A lot of times social security requires things to happen through um, online. Also Medicare can be, oh, such a nightmare to deal with online, but make sure your family has that um, number and account information and your driver's license, just in case your driver's license isn't around when you need it. You also want to be gathering passwords, usernames, and security questions for the health stuff, the doctor's office, those portals, the health insurance, the pharmacies. If nothing else, your family members can be logging in and seeing what your current prescriptions are if you're in a situation where medical professionals need to know. Then, of course, you think about your utilities, the regular kind of bills you pay, maybe you're good to go, a venture pass. Sometimes these, um, these things kind of uh, rebill after a year, and you want to make sure that there's money in the account. You want people to know how your cell phone is paid for. You might want people in your family to, you know, if you're going to be in a rehab facility, you know, uh, uh, healing from a leg injury for two, three months. Maybe you want to pause your expensive cable TV at the house, right? But make sure that the water isn't paused. So you want to make sure your bills are paid. So having those things available for your people is helpful. Then you get into things that are really less, um, you know, legally exciting, but you want to make sure that your people can cancel, let's say, the Hulu, the Netflix, magazines, Things that might recur, have recurring billing, and might be weird if the checking account has been closed. If you use Facebook, it has memorialization settings, as well as you can share your login password with your family, but they have settings that have different levels to them. So Facebook can allow somebody to just, based on your um, um, uh, your settings beforehand, somebody might just be able to come in and you know, make a post that, that you've passed and nothing else can be posted or they and they can't see any messages that people have sent to you or there's some settings where they have full access. And we are, you know, long enough in the digital world now that Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter are around, but MySpace, there's, there's definitely old social networks that don't exist anymore, you know, or that we don't use anymore, we don't think about, maybe there's somebody who doesn't use them much anymore but you want to make sure that people have the information to go close out those accounts because why not close them out? There's no good that's going to come to anything, you know, left open under your name. Not everything is a security risk, but why not give them the tools to close things down? Again, then besides passwords and usernames and security questions, let's gather up photos and documents, especially digital ones. So the digital, there maybe you use Smug Mug for your photos or you use these Flickr, other online galleries where your photos were. Maybe your photos are, sometimes people have texted you things or they, maybe there were email attachments. Um, I have one client who's, someone had emailed her a link to the very last 
video of her husband at his very last birthday party. And she said, I don't know how to get this and save it. So you are going to want to download those photos, download those videos, get those things out of your email because nobody will know they're there. Take your time gathering those things. You may have many things in your downloads folder on your computer, your documents folder, your desktop. When I talk to people about the downloads folder, when you download something, you're not alone. There are so many people who will download something and they go, I have no idea where it went. Where did it go? I can never find it again. Well, sometimes it's just sitting in your downloads folder. And I like to say that a download folder is more like a hall a hall table. You know, a table when you just come in your house, it's kind of a place to put your keys, a place to set your groceries while you take off your shoes. And then you take your groceries and you put them away. So a downloads folder is sort of a temporary location where you want to go in and move those things if it's photos. You want to move them into your photos. If it's documents, if it's things, you want to take it from that hall table and put it in the right room and organize it. Right? Your desktop. Well, sometimes people are really happy. They go, look, everything is right here on my desktop. Well, sure, that might make it easy for you to find things, but that's not a great place to store things digitally on your computer. You want to organize them into files and into folders. So it's good to have like items with like items. It's good to put have all your pictures in one spot. It's good to have all your documents in one spot. Luckily, both the big systems, both Mac, Apple systems, and Windows systems have folders called documents and photos. And by making sure your things are in there, it can make it very easy to back up and store them. Well, this is like putting the items in bins. Now, unfortunately, this is only an hour and it's not a full technology course. So I'll, I see already there's a question. How do we do that? Well, either you have a technician do that for you or you learn how to move your files around. It's actually not as hard as you think. Um, this is like an example of organizing those socks. You figure out the destination before you start. You figure out where's my pictures folder? How do I move things into that? You can make a new folder if you need to. Under those picture folders, maybe you have a folder called Trip to Hawaii 1982, and that way you can organize all your photos into that. You move your files in. Both Macs and PCs have ways you can drag them in, it has ways you can tell them in. I can't teach you how to do it in a class like today with this overview, but it is very doable. It's very doable. I challenge you to learn or get help to get them organized. It's very satisfying when they're organized. Then I'd like you to step into the realm of physical objects. So um, you look in this picture, this is from a client just a couple weeks ago, you'll notice all those little thumb drives and the little, <clears throat> those little chips down in the bottom right of that picture. Those, were, those used to go in digital cameras and they were like the size of literally your thumbnail, or some of them are like half the size of that. Lots of little thumb drives. So take all those things, even if you're not going to deal with them, just put them in a bin or a box or something and label them and put it near your paper photos. Because it's so easy for something like this to just wind up in the back of a drawer and you don't, people might not see it. It might just get, you know, tossed out. So bring those things together and label them, put them near your photos. And I, I like people to think about digitizing their paper photos. I'll tell you how we might go about that. So that's gathering, a lot of gathering. You're gonna spend a lot of time gathering, a lot of time gathering. So then we're going into secure. And secure, everybody's gonna have some different secure um, opinions about the best ways to do things. So again, it's got to fit for your life and your comfort level. So let's look at some ways that we secure things. So first thing, passwords. We should be dealing with this whether or not we're thinking about our legacy just for ourselves. So just for ourselves, let's deal with securing our passwords. 
So I'm going in a hierarchy. Saving your passwords and the affiliated information. A password vault is most secure. They store passwords. They all have different ways that they might have remote access for family members. And they're very, and they are also the most complex way. Um, you enter your um, passwords that you know, and it can usually capture other ones as you use them. And don't forget to put in things like your passport and driver's license number. I used to, when I first started doing this, I used to recommend this to everyone. And then it was very clear that the reality is that these password software vaults, like LastPass, OnePass, Dashlane, there's so, so many of them, are great, they're fantastic, they're secure, absolutely no question. They are also complex because they are software that needs to be understood. You need to learn about the software, you need to install it, you need to keep it updated, you need to make sure it's on. Sometimes you can wind up being logged off and you don't realize it hasn't been updating for a while. So you really have to commit to understanding and learning the software. And, and let there be no shame in noting that for many people, that's not the right path. Many, many people, it's not the right path to use this software, this password vault software. So what's another step? If that is too complex, if the idea of downloading and learning a new software, installing it to your web browser and keeping it updated is not for you, well, there's other options. There's another one. This one's pretty easy. And this one is kind of frictionless. So all of the regular browsers, Chrome, Edge, Safari, they have settings where you could ask them to remember your passwords. They will fill in, if you, if you allow them to, they'll fill in the passwords when you go to the website again. Many of them will tell you if the passwords have been compromised or if they're secure, it's kind of nice. Um, again, it's kind of frictionless. You don't even notice it. You set the settings on your um, browser and it's good to go. If you do this, I encourage you to stick to the one browser. So if sometimes you use Chrome and, and you know you Google something and sometimes you use Safari because you're on a Mac and you know, one is going to hold some passwords and one is going to hold other passwords and it's kind of a mess. So if you do this, or if you're setting this up for a family member, say here, your passwords are being saved on Google on Chrome, just use this and it's easy peasy. So make sure if you do this, that you can access those accounts. Make sure you have your Google, Microsoft and Apple passwords. Remember that somebody else can sit down at your computer and use that and use, use your browser and the passwords will be in it. Many, many people though have a pretty fairly secure home life and really the best they can do is there's a little more risk to it, but it's how they can do it. So it's always a balance of the accessibility and the complexity. So even if this is too much for you, you will get no judgment from me if you need paper. But if you need paper to use paper, there are better ways to use paper and there are worse ways to use paper. So when people need to use paper, I encourage them to get something like an old fashioned plain old address book with the little alphabetical tabs there. And you can write down, you know, if you're at Wells Fargo, you can go to the W and put Wells Fargo and put your information there. And when you, excuse me, and when you change your password, put a big line through it, write the new password and put the date. What is really hard is to see folks who have a folder full of pages of passwords. And for anyone that would be nerve wracking, if you're somebody who's challenged with some memory issues, some things going on, you know, you're looking through these pages and maybe you've got your Netflix um, password written down in three different places and it's three different passwords and you don't know which one is recent or not. Just make it easy on yourself. Don't use post-its. Don't use loose pieces of paper unless you have some particularly organized way for using loose pieces of paper. But having it be 
alphabetized in a book. Uh, no one will tell you that this is a secure way to have your important passwords. No one, not even me. And you know what? The real world is that there are plenty of people who can just barely use their computers, and this is the best they can do. So if that's you, make it easy. Don't have sheets and sheets and sheets in a file folder. Treat yourself to an address book, something like that. There are other ways, but these are three ways that you can use to organize and secure your passwords. Then let's talk about those photos and the documents. Remember I showed you that picture of all of those chips and cards and things from that camera? I work, uh, I'll be real quick, I'll be real quick. So I worked with somebody yesterday using this little plug-in device with camera chips. She had over 8,000 photos that had never been taken off of those little things. Going back to, I don't know, 2007. Um, I thought I would be doing that all the time when I started the business in 2018. Never have done it until two separate people this month who handed me these boxes and said, we need to get this stuff out of here. These little things are not <laughs> very robust. The new ones, if you get a brand new one that's solid state, you know, if you bought one in the last couple of years, they're probably pretty secure. But the old ones, they have little moving parts in, they break, they, you know, don't, don't think of that as a permanent storage space. Okay? So get them off of those things. If you are scanning your pictures, you can think about somebody is eventually going to have to scan those pictures. If you scan those pictures, make sure if you're doing it yourself, that you are scanning them into a picture format. If you are using the same kind of scanner that you scan your documents on, there's a chance you could be scanning them in from a from picture into a digital format, which is into a document format called a PDF, which is not going to be great down the road because computers will not think that they're photos. So then how are we securing them? Everything is digitized. We've got our documents. We've got our papers. We've got our stuff. One way is to have a cloud sync a backup. This is a huge topic, as you can imagine. Um, you might have OneDrive or Google Drive or iCloud or Dropbox. You might have all these things copied both on your computer and elsewhere. And it makes it very easy to share the files with family members. So what it is, is you've got a copy of them on your machine. And the cloud has actually nothing to do with clouds or harps. There's nothing at all cloudy or weather related about it. It's just another machine. It's just another um, storage hard drive externally owned by Microsoft or Google or Apple. And huge buildings and there's so much security and redundancy. So. Um, you've got a copy of them in your home in case there's a flood and your computer gets water damaged. Now there's still a copy of them that you can get from anywhere else, any other computer in the world. People have different feelings about that. I understand. So that's okay. You can also or and or um, save things that's called locally, meaning you have not just the hard drive in your computer or your phone. You've got an extra one that you bought at the store, a new one with a solid straight five, not one from 25 years ago. And you're backing things up, you're saving your pictures there, so they're on your computer and then on this other thing, right? Which is great. The only thing is, you know, if your house floods, both your computer and the little hard drive are wet. So that's okay. Um, you know, if you have a Mac, you've got a time machine that, uh, you know, backs up things. You also might want to have backup software like, you know, people use Carbonite and things. Um, then you want to notify. You want to notify the folks in your life, whether those are family members, whether that's your the paralegal at your lawyer's office. You want to keep a copy of at least your plan uh, with your will. You want to have people be able to get into if you have an online vault. Um, you want to keep that you want the people who would be making the decision to plug or unplug, you know, the life support system to be able to have that kind of information about how to step in with your life. Right? And that is a blindingly fast overview. You can obviously see that there are many, many personal situations that require very 
specific answers to those things and, a, and some level of computer knowledge, right? Learning how to move those files or having somebody come in and move your files and organize things for you, right? That's There are people who come organize your garage, right? Because you don't want to organize your garage or your back, you know, isn't up to organizing your garage. There's people who will organize your digital stuff too. Woo! <laughs> that is the fastest I've ever been through that. You'll get the notes. And I'll answer some questions, how about, in the Q&A, and maybe some have been answered. How secure is cloud storage? Well, it's what your bank uses. So cloud storage has banking level security. That, you know, whether you feel comfortable with it or not, anytime you go somewhere and do something through a browser, you're dealing with the cloud. Our stuff is in the cloud. So Microsoft, Apple, Google are uh, very, incentivized to have that information be very secure. So it's good for you to look it up and see how, how comfortable you feel with it. Is there a way to future-proof the media currently on my hard drives? Ooh, I'm not exactly sure what future-proof means, but making sure that they are in um, more than one place is good. Um, making sure that they are in the... Uh, widely accepted formats. So if, if they're movies, they might be .mov, or if they're pictures, they're gonna be .jpg. And if you don't know what I'm saying, it's okay, don't worry about it um, for this particular person's answer. So I there was a long time ago, I don't know, out of the 492 of us were here, if anybody remembers a company that used to be called Seattle Filmworks. They were the first ones involved in the digital world of film. You'd take your film, your uh, physical film, You'd mail it to them and they'd send you back your pictures plus a CD, you know, with like how cool your photos were now digitized. And this was in <clears throat> before Y2K. Right? So, well, what has said my family was being, oh, everything was, well, you know what? They weren't saving them as regular old pictures. They were saving them as Seattle Filmworks picture files. And you know what? Eventually Seattle Filmworks went out of business and eh, there's no way to read this. No, no works files. There's no legitimate way. I mean, there's you could go on the dark web and find somebody to do it for. Anyway, so future proof by making sure that your stuff is in ordinary things like PDFs and JPEGs. So if that's the answer to your question, which password app do you suggest? Ooh, I'm gonna make that really short. I many, many, many of them, and people will. Um, People will very much uh, um, debate which ones. For myself, I use LastPass. Even though LastPass just had a big issue that I'm not happy with, I like LastPass because LastPass has a system where inside of LastPass, I can designate both of my sons as having emergency access. And they have to accept it from their email. And what it does, they can't get into my passwords and they can't do anything. All they can do is ask LastPass, let me into my mom's, I'm the, I'm the designated person, let me into my mom's account. And what LastPass does is it takes this period of time that I have previously set up and it asks me, is it okay to let David in? Is it okay to let David in? Maybe maybe that's a two hour or maybe it's five days. They're gonna try and get hold of me. Is it okay to get in? And if I don't answer, I'm in the hospital or if I'm laying on the beach in Tahiti and I don't have any device, right? They're gonna say, Okay, after that period of time learning. So my sons are set up for immediate access. They both live long, far away. Um, but for I like that buffer time because there are some people who have complex family relationships and they go, I don't want my person to be able to jump in and get my passwords anytime. I wanna let I wanna put up a barrier of a couple of days. So that's why I like LastPass. There's plenty, plenty, plenty of other ones that people are using. That they will um, that they will advocate. Uh, oh, so many questions. Oh, I know I won't be able to get. Uh, so there's some of these are repeat. So let me. Okay. Um, let me get back up to. Okay. Uh, how do I search out email accounts? I may have forgotten. I have. Boy, I don't know. <laughs> but think about it. Look about it. Look at your computer. You're the only person who has that information. Sorry. 
I'd like to know if password managers are a good idea. They are. We talked about those. We talked about password. Alternatives for 2FA if they start. Oops. Alternatives. Uh, uh, for those of us who don't own a cell phone. Well, two-factor authentication can also oftentimes be an email address and a they can call you on a landline and speak the code numbers to you. So look at, you know, you have to see what the website will allow, but if they'll only do email, pick your email and then have a family member, another trusted person's email so they can be the backup, right? In case your password gets lost, you know, they can help you get access. Um, Closing unused email accounts for security purposes. <clears throat> I think there's no benefit to leaving unused accounts open into eternity. I just can't imagine any positive. Here. I recommend LastPass. So again, LastPass is complex. If you don't like technology and if you don't like learning about stuff and if you don't like keeping things updated, don't do it because it'll just be a big tangle for you. So I like it and I like tech. A good photo app to use with Windows. Not sure what that means. Um, Windows has ways that stores and organizes photos. Where are we saving all these passwords and usernames? I went on that slide. You can use Password Vault. You might use your browser to save them. You might use the book. Any tips for identifying photos that are more than one location? It really depends on your own system. But you know, if you have a lot of storage space, it's just not going to be. It's not going to be a big, uh, is it worth your time to deal with that? I guess is, is the question. Um, password vaults, I'm just going to let that go. Again, you, you heard me say, password vault is a big tech stretch. So don't feel compelled to use those. Any advice on how to access info on old technology, floppies, et cetera? Yes. So, you can buy these little gizmos. This one was for camera chips. You can buy them for CDs and DVD drives, and you can buy them for um, floppy drive. I have one for a floppy drive. It's very, there's very little information on floppy drives. But you buy them. They're very cheap. They're very cheaply made. They're very cheap devices. And you plug it into the USB port of your computer. And then you can put in the DVD or the whatever it is, all the information. Curious why password vaults are more secure, better than the browser password feature. Um, you know, it's you can turn it on and off more easily than the browser thing. It's a whole separate. So if somebody compromises your Google account, they don't have all your passwords. It's just a different way of doing it. It's 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 less complex, and and it's no problem to use the browser password features. It's literally I wasn't. Don't worry about um, the difference between them. Really, it's just fine to use that middle one too. Get pictures off an old MacBook that seems to be no longer able to access the internet. Yeah, um, uh, you can, if it can't do the internet, you can you know, run a cable between the two of them. You can put the photos on something. You can take it to a computer place. There's a, there's a place in Redmond that I love using. Um, and they can pull it off. They can pull them off. They can take the hard drive and pull them off. I don't know if it's okay for me to use a, mention a little. Is it okay for me to mods? Is there is it okay for me to mention a little a little store in Redmond to do this? Um, I look. I'm looking in the webinar chat. So one of the hosts will tell me. Is it okay for me to mention the name of the little spot? Okay. Uh, PC Recycle on Cleveland Way in, in Redmond. It's just, it looks like you go into a junkyard for cars, but it's computers. And it's just a couple people there. They've been there forever. Um, you just hand them the Mac. Look, I just did this is my son's Mac. Ancient Mac. I don't think it works. You pull the stuff off the drive and they'll do the best they can do to pull the stuff off and get it to you on a flash drive or something. And then what's great is if you ask them to, they'll just take that drive out, drill it, 
with a hand drill in front of you. So you, you go, nobody's going to get any information off of that. So I like I like sending people there. And they're not the only ones who do that. Would you suggest for printing folders in a library? What would you suggest for printing folders in a library or content folders? Um, well, if you have documents that you're printing, you would just print them. So I'm not sure that I understand that question fully. Um, I, if they're if they're in file manager, they're already digital. So I back up those digital files. Apple saves passwords to the device, not the cloud, so not hackable. Um, Apple also saves to Keychain, so that's fine. Apple using Apple's system is great too. More about what to do with those items that one wants to die with my death. All right, so some the things that, that you don't want anybody to find. Start parting with them now for one. Um, if it's something like an email account, make sure it's not tied to any of your other email accounts. Make sure it's not bookmarked on your browser. Make sure that if somebody sat down at your computer and didn't know that you had a Hotmail account, they wouldn't be able to see it. Right? Don't put that password with anything. Right? If you have photos and you use OneDrive or any of those other things, there's something called a personal vault. Like within OneDrive, there's a thing where you can put stuff in and then have another password to keep it protected and make sure that password isn't anywhere. But realize that if you have a stroke or something and you can't remember that password anymore, you can't get them back. So, but um, it, yeah, it cannot be good for people to find some things. Uh, the notes will be mailed. What should you do to scan pictures so they're not put into a PDF? Uh, there's these scanners, um, I don't know, it's like about $80 photo scanners that you just, um, you kind of pass the photos through, it's connected to your computer one by one. I have one. I think it will take me the rest of my days to go through all of those pictures that were done in the Seattle Filmworks world that were digitized forever. You do that and it takes forever. But there's a company, also a company called Bear Services, B-E-A-R, in the northern Seattle area, and he comes to your house and does that. What happens to the physical cloud building burns down or is damaged on that? Great question. Well, they have redundancy. So um, these, if those buildings burn down, it's going to be one of those things where I mean, we've been through some of them in our lifetimes, but it's going to be one of those, it's got to be something, uh, well, I don't want to make bad scenario. It would be a very bad scenario, but they are duplicated in more than one location. OneDrive, the phone app has an amazing photo scanner. It corrects the photo. Good. Somebody's saying OneDrive has a photo scanning app. Best way to tackle photo organizing, lots of photos. Yeah. Get, di get them digitized. Google sent about that. Okay. So somebody is saying, uh, we forgot the passphrase for their Google Sync security. How do you see that sharing the two-factor authentication? I think we talked about that. You either are um, putting it in a password vault that has emergency access. If you're storing your stuff in Chrome, make sure your family members know those passwords. If you have a book, it makes it very hard to share. If you could send them a picture. Um, where do we put things like a paper list of passwords in a home safe with combination lock? I mean, this is a question that for you, um, my, what's my opinion of using CDs for backup storage? Not great anymore because very few devices come with CDs anymore, CD readers. So I don't love that. Um, the thing is, oh gosh, we only have five minutes. All right. All right. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I'm, and I'm going through the Q of A, not, not the chat. So um, the key is there's this balance, right, between security and between accessibility. So if all of your passwords are in your safe, in your house, with a combo, make sure that somebody else knows the combo. Or maybe if your family is across the country, you know, and you're going to need them to get into your stuff, maybe that's not a great solution because somebody's going to have to fly over and open the, 
the thing. Or maybe both of you begin to forget the combo and then you leave it unlocked. So the example I like to use is I have a window here in, in my apartment. And in the summertime, I have it open on nice days and there's a screen there because that is comfortable for me. I can only leave it open in the daytime. I tend to keep an eye on who's walking around. Is that secure? Absolutely not. Having a screen is just like having it open. Somebody could walk in and, you know, whatever. But I make that judgment. My front door has one lock and one key. Well, it would be safer if it was built like a bank vault lock, right? With like 12 volts and things, right? But we make these compromises all the time. So make sure that you, your stuff is secure, but somebody can get to it is a bit like how many locks do you want in your front door? Um, hundreds of scanned photos. Organize them if you want to. Uh, new photos now all have a date and everything in them. If you want to just organize them by date or something, it depends on what system you're using. Sort of can't answer that question. Uh, do I use the free version of Last Files? I no, I I pay them. What is it, fifty, sixty bucks a year? But again, again, don't go use LastPass if if it's too tough for you. Gizmo. I don't know what Gizmo means. How to deal with parents that have already died? Didn't move online. Well, I think our first question was really tough. Um, it was related to that. Meaning if somebody, if you don't have their information and I work with people, I come into the widow, we pull together what we can get. We pull together, um, you know, let's reset the password. Maybe we can get into their email. Maybe we can get into something. Otherwise you're going to these companies with the death certificates and it takes for all. So I think I kind of need to stop there. Would that be about right, Tara? Yes, Bridget, you are. Oh, I am sorry. so impressed with your, no, you got to so many questions and we let you go. So I'm sorry to wrap up this very fun party. Uh -huh. um, we're just so grateful to everyone for being here today. And I want to thank you all. Um, and be sure when everybody exits this webinar that you take a very short survey because everyone who takes the survey uh, will be entered to win a bag of books from each of our library systems. So that's two bags of books up for grabs. It's a very short survey. We appreciate your time. And your thank comments you so are much. really appreciated. Yes. Really thank you all so much. And Bridget, best. thank you for, for everything. You're wonderful. Um, you, everybody will get a recording of this. It will also be posted on the SPLF YouTube page. And you'll get a copy of Bridget's notes as she kept referencing. So you can go back and rewatch this as many times as you'd like. Um, let me see here. Uh, we also want to share the news that Library Giving Day is coming on Tuesday, April 4th. So, and both of our library foundations are participating. We hope that you will take a minute to show your library love and consider making a gift on Library Giving Day, April 4th. And in addition, um, a charitable bequest is one of the most meaningful ways that you can support your library. So if you are thinking of including us in your plans or you're definitely including us in your plans, let us know so we can say thank you while you're still with us and add you to our legacy societies. Um, stay tuned for news about our upcoming plan giving webinars. We do these on a quarterly basis. We've got a year long series coming. Uh, you'll get an invitation to that soon. Thank you again, Bridget. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a wonderful day. And thank you again for supporting your libraries. Take care.